Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're located. Um, my name is Matt Baum. I'm the Marvin Cowell Professor of Global Communications at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, and uh, I'm also the co-sponsor uh, of this seminar, the uh, jointly sponsored uh, Shorenstein Center at Harvard and the new lab for text maps and networks at Northeastern University. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to real uh, quickly just advertise the, the last two uh, sessions we're going to do this term. So on April 22nd, we have Dana Young from the University of Delaware, and that'll be at noon uh, on Wednesday on the 22nd. And then on uh, May 5th, we have Rasmus Kleiss Nielsen, uh, who will be uh, speaking a little bit earlier because of the time difference. He's coming to us from, uh, from the UK. Uh, at, that'll be at 10.30 a.m. Um, so please join us for those. Okay, so the main event today, uh, we're very happy to have Jennifer Pan here visiting uh, with us from Stanford University, where she's an assistant professor of communication, also uh, assistant professor by courtesy in the political science and sociology departments at Stanford University. Um, her research is at the intersection of political communication and authoritarian politics. She focuses on showing how authoritarian governments work to shape public attitudes and behaviors, how the public responds, and when and why each of these are successful. Uh, her work has, uh, has appeared in numerous top journals, in uh, journals in all three of the disciplines that I mentioned, uh, and in, this includes a truly remarkable four articles in the, uh, the American Political Science Review, which is incredible for anybody, but for a 2015 PhD, that's nearly one a year, which uh, if she keeps that up, it's gonna be uh, something for the record books. Um, she's also the author of Welfare for Autocrats, How Social Assistance in China Cares for Its Rulers uh, from uh, 2020 uh, from Oxford University Press. She received her PhD, I mentioned in 2015, from the Harvard Government Department. And today, she's going to be speaking uh, on a study of Confucius Institute teachers around the world. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Pan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's really uh, great to be here. This is a joint work with Ying Jiefan and Tong Tong Zhang, who are at Stanford. So in the past few years, there's this growing idea that China is exporting its political system or certain features of its political system, the so-called China model um, of authoritarian as opposed to democratic governance. And one of the most heavily criticized efforts of the Chinese government's global outreach are Confucius Institutes. Confucius Institutes were founded in just 2004 but now they are the world's largest government funded culture and language promotion program. This is a map of Confucius Institutes around the world as of 2018. There have been some changes since 2018, but as of last year, there were over 500 Confucius Institutes operating at universities and over a thousand what are called Confucius classrooms in primary and secondary schools in over 160 countries. And if you look at this map, you can see that these Confucius Institutes and classrooms are really all over, from France to the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Canada to North Korea. Um, each year, about 40,000 Confucius Institute teachers are interacting with students in these countries. And since its founding in 2004, more than 12 million students have participated in Confucius Institute programs. Uh, Confucius Institutes are quite controversial, uh, especially here in the US. In 2000, uh, in last year, August of 2020, Confucius Institutes were designated by the State Department as a foreign mission. And the main critiques against Confucius Institutes are that they are vehicles for Chinese government propaganda, indoctrination, and censorship. The idea is that Confucius Institutes are spreading Chinese government uh, propaganda, indoctrinating young people around the world into a view of China that the Communist Party wants to advance, and that they also censor political debates and prevent discussions of topics that domestically in China are censored and overall kind of curtailing academic freedom. 
But the issue is that despite all this controversy over Confucius Institutes, there's there are not that many empirical studies of Confucius Institutes. There are a number of qualitative studies uh, based on interviews with Confucius Institute teachers and directors. There's one quantitative study, which is a survey of US students who are learning Chinese in Confucius Institute classrooms. The finding there, uh, just as an aside, is that at least at the primary and edu uh, secondary level, uh, these Confucius classrooms don't produce any sort of pro-China viewpoints among American students. Okay, um, so what we set out to do is to look at the behavior of Confucius Institute teachers. So if propaganda and censorship are the main charges that are leveled against Confucius Institutes, then we should look at the behaviors of these teachers, which are the way in which students are interacting with content. Uh, so the questions that motivate this research are, how does the Chinese government shape the behavior of Confucius Institute teachers? How do they control? How much control do they have? To what extent are teachers disseminating the political views of the Chinese Communist Party or censoring discussions of politically sensitive topics? And most importantly, uh, what motivates or shapes the behavior of teachers? And we do this using a combination of different methods. We start by conducting interviews with Confucius Institute teachers, directors, analyzing training and evaluation materials, uh, as well as observing several teacher training sessions in the US. And based on that qualitative work, we then designed and conducted a survey with an embedded survey experiment that reached uh, 284 Confucius Institute teachers who are uh, coming from more than 70 countries. Based on our uh, qualitative work, we find that the Chinese government does not issue any sort of specific instructions to Confucius Institute teachers on what to do or what to say when it comes to political topics. They don't tell teachers they have to censor. They don't tell teachers they have to say a particular thing. Uh, so I'll go through this in uh, a little bit of uh, different steps. So first in terms of selection, we don't find evidence that Confucius Institute teachers are selected for, their particular, for any particular set of political beliefs. Uh, the, the process of selection is that there's a pool of current Chinese teachers in China or university students who are studying teaching Chinese, uh, teaching Chinese as a second language. And that's a potential pool of Confucius Institute teachers. We went through the, and, and the first step in the application process is this online application, which is open and which we uh, went through. In that online application, we found no questions related to political preferences or management of political topics. The questions really are oriented toward applicants' experience in teaching Chinese, uh, their, both their Mandarin and foreign language capabilities. And the only political question is whether the applicant is a Communist Party member. After this online application, um, the next step is face-to-face, uh, is a written test, and then a face-to-face -face interview. We, we talked to about two dozen Confucius Institute teachers, and they none of them recalled any questions on their written test that had to do with political topics. And in the in-person interview, uh, the interview is about 30 minutes, 10 minutes is about uh, talking in the language of the host country. So if the teacher wants to teach in an English speaking country, those 10 minutes are spent speaking English. And then the remaining 20 minutes of the interview are general questions related to teaching. For example, simulating a lesson on Chinese grammar. Uh, and rather than seeing this as a kind of political assignment, all the interviews, interviews we talked to describe Confucius Institutes as a type of gap year between uh, kind of college and work or a break from working in China. And as we'll see later, this is borne out by our survey data, where the most frequently reported reason that teachers have for joining Confucius Institutes is to broaden their horizons. We have other options related to career, et cetera, but that, that was not the main kind of reason teachers join. It's to experience something outside of China. Um, we also find that in the training of Confucius Institute teachers, Confucius Institute teachers are not given explicit training on how to handle political topics. All Confucius Institute teachers have to complete a training program in China before they start their overseas assignment. Uh, 
This is usually about 30 days, so a month long training. And the training is focused mostly on Chinese culture, language, how to teach Chinese effectively. They're also taught, uh, given basics on living outside of China, uh, and we obtain full class schedules for several training sessions. And we find that out of 30 days, there's one lecture during the training, approximately two hours long, that dealt with political topics. So these are photos of the slides from uh, this training and this, this one session on politics. And the emphasis of the session, one, one big emphasis was how to avoid being recruited by foreign intelligence agencies, such as the FBI, CIA. Um, and what we heard from teachers is that this particular two hour session is not designed specifically for Confucius Institute teachers, but given to all Chinese nationals who are conducting official business abroad. Uh, we also look at uh, textbook usage and monitoring of teachers. On textbooks, we find that teachers are not required to use uh, materials from the Chinese government. And most, CIT, most Confucius Institute teachers use whatever textbooks were already being used at their schools. Uh, finally, we find that there's very little day-to-day -day monitoring of Confucius Institute teachers. In terms of classroom activities, there's really no one other than the teachers and students who have a sense of what's going on. Once a semester, the Chinese directors of the Confucius Institutes might sit in on classes, uh, and once a year, there's a teacher evaluation. We obtain copies of these evaluations and find no evidence that teachers are evaluated for their political attitudes or political behaviors in the classroom. So altogether, our qualitative research shows that the Chinese government is not issuing instructions to guide or shape Confucius Institute teacher behavior. And they're not, they're, there's no mechanism through which they're enforcing behavior with rewards or, or punishments on a day-to-day -day basis based on teachers' classroom activities. However, uh, when we looked at the training slides from that two-hour session that had to do with politics, one thing we noticed that is that there are these general objectives. Um, they're kind of time spent on these very broad, somewhat vague, ambiguous objectives like avoid saying anything that will hurt the motherland, avoid doing anything that will hurt national dignity or your personal integrity, resist the decay and decadence of bourgeoisie capitalism. Um, these, you know, this is very broad, all encompassing sort of language and approach. And I think initially we kind of just dismissed this. But as we talk to teachers more, we, we realize that these objectives are how the Chinese government is shaping and controlling the behavior of Confucius Institute teachers. So let me take a really brief detour on theory. If we think about how do the powerful secure the compliance and obedience of those they dominate, um, there's two general approaches. So intrinsic, create intrinsic changes in people or obtain compliance extrinsically. So if intrinsic factors are used, then this is about shaping and influencing subjects' internal beliefs and attitudes. So this is indoctrination. Um, but a second way you can get com political uh, compliance is extrinsically. And most of the literature here is about those in power issue directives on how subjects should behave, and compliance is adherence to those specific sets of behaviors. Um, but what we found in, in this research and what we can conceptualize is that there's a different way of obtaining political obedience extrinsically. So one, as I mentioned, you prescribe these behaviors, but the second is that you lay out objectives. Um, these objectives are general, but they're explicit, but they don't detail behavior. So those in power simply lay out objectives or outcomes to be pursued or avoided. And those uh, subjects can decide on their own how they should behave in order to achieve those objectives. And the scholars have long identified this type of extrinsic kind of influence, but they've called it different things from non-decision-making power to norms. And I'm gonna use an example of censorship comparing Soviet and Maoist era censorship to, to show how these two extrinsic factors differ. So in the Soviet Union, um, uh, the, the Soviets published periodic handbooks that listed specific phrases that were out of bounds, and they employed a really large bureaucracy to enforce these rules. In contrast, in China under Mao, 
and in the early reform period, they never had a bureaucracy like the Soviets enforce censorship. They never published handbooks on what things were banned. Instead, even though they had the capacity to take these actions, they rejected these more mechanical methods in favor of a system that relies on self-enforcement by telling people, you can't cross a line. Um, you can't act in counter-revolutionary counter ways. Uh, you can't threaten national unity and stability. And left it up to individuals on how they, how they uh, behave to achieve those objectives and general guidelines. Um, and so these two different extrinsic influences are enforced differently. When it's prescription of behavior, material rewards and punishments are easy to apply. If you behave this way, you'll give some reward. If you behave in a non-prescribed manner, you'll be punished. But that's harder to do when you prescribe these objectives, because by design, it's hard to say what kind of behavior will lead to what reward or punishment. Instead, social pressures and sanctions are, are used to enforce prescription of uh, these objectives. And this is people putting pressure on each other to pursue these objectives and outcomes, leading to an understanding that uh, by any one person of what is normal and expected in a broader social environment. Um, and so to, to kind of test this explicitly, whether uh, Confucius Institute teachers are being um, whether the, the pres prescription objectives that we observed in the training has any effect, we design a survey and experiment um, to show that whether or not to test whether or not this is at play. So this is a survey that we conducted online between February and March of 2019. We recruited respondents through Confucius Institute directors in the US, and then we uh, recruited through snowball sampling uh, outside of the US. We screened out non-Chinese nationals and Confucius Institute administrators who are not teachers. Okay. So this is a uh, map of where our respondents came from. The country with the most respondents is the US followed by Brazil, uh, Australia, and then Thailand. The respondents range in age from 23 to 69. The mean age of respondents is 34 and the median age is 32. And you know, nearly 80% are 40 years or younger. So this is kind of most Confucius Institute teachers are quite young. Many of them are recent college graduates. In our sample, 58% uh, were women, the remaining were men. Most respondents are very highly educated. Over 60% have a master's or doctoral degree. And another, you know, nearly 35% have a bachelor's degree. Um, about half of respondents had prior full-time teaching experience, but most of these teachers don't have that much experience. Um, and in terms of Communist Party membership, um, there are roughly half are Communist Party members. So this, is, for those of you who are familiar with China, this is obviously much higher Communist Party membership than the general population, but it's not that much higher when you look at teachers in China. So college teachers who are college graduates, based on the China General Social Survey um, more relatively recently, I think about 35% were Communist Party members. Okay, so although this membership rate is very high for the general population, it's not that high when we look at uh, the population of interest, which are teachers who are highly educated. Okay. So we don't know how representative the sample is of the population of 40,000 teachers who are teaching every year. Uh, China, the Chinese government doesn't publish any sort of demographic in, in, information about Confucius Institute teachers, but the sample exhibits characteristics such as highly educated, relatively young, more women than men that we expect to see among Confucius Institute teachers based on previous qualitative um, research. So I'm going to illustrate what happens in our survey and the experiment. So first, after the screening, we ask teachers a lot of demographic questions. And then for 50% of the sample, we add an anonymity re reminder. Uh, this is what it is. It says, all your answers are not anonymous and strictly confidential. They'll only be used for academic research. So we don't actually collect any personally identifiable information for any of the teachers or any of the respondents. But we give this anonymity reminder to have, try to get a sense of preference falsification. We're asking politically sensitive questions respondents might feel pressures to respond in a particular way. But if kind of these pressures are not at work, we expect to see no difference on average between the responses of those who get this anonymity reminder and those who don't. Okay. 
Uh, then uh, we randomly assign respondents into three groups. The first group receives this message, which is a reminder of a very vague objective. Just says, people conducting official business overseas should adhere to the disciplinary requirements of the gover government of the People's Republic of China when interacting with foreigners. So there's no specific content to this. It's just a reminder of the objectives that the teachers received during their training. Um, a second group receives what we call a social prime. So this is testing the mechanism that enforcement is happening through you know, social sanctions and social pressures. This prime reads, in daily work and social interactions, people should avoid friction and conflict with others who have a different point of view. So this doesn't say anything about the Chinese government. It is purely making teachers more attuned to their social dynamics. And finally, the control group sees uh, just the statement that people encounter different scenarios in life and work. For the first two treatment groups, respondents are asked uh, to reflect on the prime and one or two reasons why, you know, what are the benefits and advantages of following um, the statement in the prime that they saw. Okay, so then uh, to measure our outcomes, we give vignettes to the respondents. And these vignettes are the same across treatment groups. 50% uh, of respondents are randomly assigned to read an in-class student vignette. So in this vignette, we tell respondents to think about a Confucius Institute teacher who teaches at a high school. One day that teacher is teaching geography and a student asks, Are, you know, aren't Taiwan and China two independent countries? Uh, so this is a situation where a student raises a politically sensitive topic about Taiwanese sovereignty. Uh, and we want to see, does the teacher parrot the view of the Chinese Communist Party, which is that uh, definitely they're not two separate countries, or do they just stop and censor the classroom discussion, or did they do something else? For the remaining 50% of respondents, they read a private student vignette, what we call a private colleague vignette, given in randomized order. So the private student vignette is very similar situation, but it's outside of the classroom where a high school student approaches a teacher to talk about Chinese characters, which are different between mainland China and Taiwan. And the student asks whether these two are independent countries. And the colleague vignette um, is similar, except the questioner is a colleague instead of a, uh, another teacher. And the reason we have these different vignettes is because Confucius Institute teachers may censor classroom discussions, not because this topic is controversial, but simply because it's not part of their lesson plan. And we also include vignettes uh, in, so that's why we include the private conversations. And we also include both the student teacher interaction as well as the colleague interaction because the teacher student relationship is one of unequal power and influence. And maybe teachers think they need to avoid discussing politics because the student isn't mature enough to handle the conversation. Okay, we then measure responses and uh, teachers can choose from actually a, a, a kind of large menu of multiple choice options, which I'm gonna summarize here into a couple of types. One is to just express no opinion and shut down the discussion and redirect the attention of the class. So that's self-censoring, but through self-censoring, the teacher is censoring classroom discussion. The second option um, is to disseminate the position of the Chinese Communist Party and stop future any any discussions say Taiwan is part of the People's Republic of China, let's move on. Um, the third option is actually to give different viewpoints about Taiwanese sovereignty to say, this is the Chinese government's position, this is Taiwan's position. And the fourth option is to allow for free classroom discussion of the topic. Um, respondents could also select other and then fill in the blank, which we then hand coded those responses. Okay. All right, so what do we find? How do teachers respond in the classroom? This is in the control group. So 35% of teachers express no opinion. They will just redirect the attention of the students and move the classroom along in uh, their, their lesson. So this is um, preventing discussion and the teachers are self-censoring and by doing so, they censor classroom discussions. 35% of teachers respondents in our sample do that. 37% uh, disseminate the Chinese Communist Party's position when they're asked this question and then stop future discussion. 15% of teachers uh, give both sides of the uh, debate and then the re uh, remaining 13% will allow for 
open discussion. Okay. Um, now, th these are the effects of our treatment. So first looking at the first uh, prime, the objectives prime, uh, we find that when teachers are shown this very vague statement about adhering to the Chinese government's disciplinary requirements, that has a statistically significant effect in making them more likely to just state the Chinese Communist Party's position and being less likely to self-censor. So instead of saying, we're gonna move the classroom away from this topic, they're more likely to say Taiwan is part of China. It is not an independent country. Uh, we also see directionally the same effect when we have the social prime. So remember the social prime doesn't say anything about politics, does not mention the Chinese government, we find that the social prime also decreases self-censorship and it has a positive effect on the CCP position, but the effect is not statistically significant. Okay. So at first glance, um, and okay, sorry, one thing we, we did do is uh, after the multiple choice outcome measures, we asked teachers to tell us why they chose a particular response in an open-ended way. Um, and here, this is, I'm showing you the responses in our first treatment group, which is the CCP objective to crime. 21% chose to self-censor. So this is decreased much lower than the uh, control group. 47% ex expressed the Chinese Communist Party's position. So that's the kind of effect that you saw in the table I showed you. More people are saying the, uh, the CCP's position when it comes to Taiwan, when they see the objective prime. 18% express both countries' positions on the debate, and then 14% choose open discussion. So at first glance, we might think that only self-censorship and disseminating the CCP's position constitutes political compliance. But when we look at that open-ended response from teachers of why they chose a particular response, we find that teachers actually also select two-sided position-taking and open discussions in order to comply. So, for example, one teacher, one respondent said, um, who chose a two-sided, who chose to introduce both kind of positions on the debate said, we should let students know the position of our country. However, we can make people more willing to accept our position only if we present this complicated historical issue of Taiwanese sovereignty in an open and objective way. Another teacher who um, expressed that they would have an open discussion about the topic said, Taiwan has always been part of China. Open discussion can help students be clear and convinced about this. Uh, we then systematically code all of the open-ended responses, and we find that um, the in the objectives prime, there are kind of the majority of respondents choosing two-sided and open discussions are doing it because they think persuasion is uh, more effective in shifting students to the Chinese Communist Party's position. So an important implication of just prescribing this objective is that compliance can't be measured by a narrow set of behaviors um, and behaviors that we might associate with kind of resistance. So allowing open, uncensored discussion can actually reflect a desire to uphold the objectives of those in power. Um, in our pre-analysis plan, we said we would explore heterogeneous effects for 14 covariates. Uh, all of these covariates were measured pre-treatment in that they were they appeared in the survey before the experiment section. And they include uh, gender, age, Communist Party membership, education, work experience, consumption of Chinese media, consumption of overseas media, level of seniority, perceptions of the host country, social interactions in the host country, personality, and uh, geographic uh, location, um, and a few others. So for each of these 14 covariates, we conduct significant tests on the interaction terms. And to address multiple comparisons, we adjusted p-values using three different methods. So here I'm showing you uh, the difference in effects of the CCP objectives prime, as well as the adjusted uh, significance level on the difference for all 14 covariates that we pre-registered. So the estimate here is the coefficient on the interaction between the prime and the covariate. It's followed by the standard error and unadjusted p-value. And then the last three columns report whether the difference in effects is significant at the point one level under each method of correction. And so only one covariate uh, passes any 
and in fact passes all three methods of correction and that is gender. So between men and women, there are uh, significant differences in how the prime affects them. Okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, visually how this happens. So in this uh, plot, the y-axis is the effect of the CCP objectives prime. And I'm showing you now the responses for men. And then in a moment, I'll show you for women. So for men who are shown in these circle, solid circles, the um, effect of this prime is to increase one-sided position taking, okay, and to decrease open discussion. So this is kind of what we might expect um, if, the, based on this idea of prescribing objectives. So you show people this objective and respondents decide, I'm going to parrot the position of the Chinese Communist Party and decrease and censor discussion. And that's what men do. But women actually do something very different. Uh, so these estimates are for women. And what we see here is that when you show women teachers the objective, the same prime, they increase open discussion. Um, but as I showed you before, it, it's not because they're kind of resisting the Chinese government and these objectives, but rather because these respondents think that open discussion is the best way of moving students toward the CCP position. Okay. Uh, so to, to sum up, um, what we find is that the Chinese government does not issue any specific instructions to Confucius and teachers on what to say and what to do when it comes to political topics. And I should say that our survey experiment only focused on Taiwan because that's what um, our interviewees said came up the most. But when we did our qualitative work, we you know, ask teachers about a variety of topics uh, and across there, there's no instruction I, uh, across any of those. So that included Taiwan, um, Xinjiang, minority um, issues, um, religious issues. There's no specific instructions on any of those topics to Confucius Institute teachers. Um, but our, what our you know, survey shows is for the control group is that even though the Chinese government doesn't issue any specific instructions, the vast majority of teachers either censor discussion, so 35%, or they disseminate the Chinese Communist Party's preferred position. Um, so that's where we introduce this concept of prescribing objectives to show that a government can lay out these very general and non-specific guidelines, which has a causal effect on the behavior of teachers. As an aside, I want to acknowledge that indoctrination or internalization of the views of the Chinese government is, I'm sure, happening by Confucius Institute teachers. The indoctrination kind of the beliefs of these teachers undoubtedly influences their classroom behavior, but it doesn't explain all the behavior we ob observe. Um, our primes and our treatment is not related to indoctrination, but our treatment has an effect. Um, and interestingly, we find that teachers exhibit political compliance in really varied ways. Um, teachers engage in open discussion and avoid censorship because they think that's an effective way of shifting people's attitudes. And uh, in particular, at least for this study, we find these really striking differences in expressions of political compliance between men and women teachers. Um, thanks so much for your attention. I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you so much.